Glow coil shows how vectors can act to create a great UI. In fact, they are easy to do on a slow GPU and they won't fall together when stacked. Hi, I'm Micah Johnston. I also go by the username Glowcoil. And today I'm going to be presenting a project that I've been working on called Ochre, which is a GPU accelerated vector graphics and text renderer um, library for Rust. And the primary use case that I've intended Ochre for is UI rendering. So first, I'm going to try to answer the question, why am I making a vector graphics renderer in the first place? So I would make the claim that vector graphics is by far the dominant type of representation for graphical content in user interfaces today. Um, we use it for our font formats and um, as well as emoji and HTML and CSS are, they basically comprise a vector format and a, a pretty massive amount of UIs use HTML, CSS and the <clears throat> browser rendering engine today. So, and then beyond that, most OS platform UI toolkits and cross-platform UI toolkits all use pretty much use vector graphics at this point. And that's for some important reasons. So first of all, it's just more space efficient to store the vector form of something than the image form, especially at high resolutions. But beyond that, it's a resolution independent format. So <clears throat> suppose you want your app to run on both a Retina MacBook and an older 1080p monitor. If you're using images, you have to export a new image for the retina format, whereas vector graphics can be rendered the same on different pixel densities. So that's a pretty powerful benefit. And then beyond that, it's just a good toolkit for if you have anything that's layout dependent based on the size of your window, or if you're doing something like rendering a, a waveform visualizer in a synth or a a line graph in a data visualization program. Vector graphics is just, it's a really good toolkit for, for procedural visualizations like that. So we would like to have a vector graphics renderer for our UIs, but um, now let me try to answer the question, why does it need to be GPU accelerated? So there are kind of two trends over the past 15 to 20 years or so that, um, are the reason I would say GPU acceleration is important for UIs. So the first one of these is that resolutions of our screens are going up. This is a visualization of iPhone screen sizes over time. So there's a pretty drastic increase, and this doesn't even include the latest iPhone, which if I remember right, it has something like 2,700 by 1,100 pixels. So that is a lot of pixels we need to, we need to render every frame. If you want your app to run at a smooth 60 frames per second, you have to render a lot more pixels every second. And that means using more computing power. So, but at the same time, we don't want to drain the battery if we're on a laptop or a mobile phone. And <clears throat> you need to hit that 60 frames per second deadline if you want to have a smooth app. So um, the other important trend is that GPUs have become really ubiquitous in consumer hardware. So you can you can get a lot more computation done both per second and per watt with a GPU than a consumer single CPU core. So this lets you be both more efficient and hit your frame deadlines and also more power efficient so that you don't drain the battery or <clears throat> use too much power just for rendering something simple like a UI, which because presumably you'd like to use the rest of your CPU for other applications, your app is presumably not just a UI. So um, because of increasing resolutions, and I should note, refresh rates are also starting to become an issue because 120 hertz, 144 hertz monitors are starting to enter the market. So that's even more pixels you have to paint per second. Um, GPUs are really good for highly parallel tasks and 
rendering happens to a lot of aspects of 2D rendering happen to be highly parallel since a lot of tasks you simply do the same operation per pixel. So it's a good fit for GPUs and the set of GPUs that are available in consumer hardware are a good fit for rendering UIs. So, and as kind of evidence of this, both Mac OS and Windows have been using GPU hardware to accelerate the basically the step of taking all of the different windows you have open and painting them all onto one one frame to display on your monitor, the, which is an operation called compositing. Both Mac and Windows have been using the GPU to do that for around 15 years. I think Mac since around 2004 and Windows since 2007 with Vista. So, and in addition to that, browsers are also increasingly taking advantage of the GPU. So um, there's evidence that it is a good idea to use GPU acceleration to render the UI for both efficiency and um, power efficiency reasons. So hopefully I've convinced you that a GPU accelerated vector renderer is a desirable thing to have for a UI, but using the GPU comes with a catch. And that's basically that um, you can't just write a single program and then run it on every GPU out in the wild. There is a big variety of manufacturers and then of APIs and platforms which give you some subset of the APIs, but not all of them. So I have this table here showing which APIs are available on which operating systems. And there isn't really an API that has full coverage of all the operating systems you might want to target. OpenGL looks promising, but it's it's officially deprecated on Apple platforms. And even before that, there was only a, an older version with more limited features was supported. And um, this table actually looks a bit more rosy than the real situation because Vulkan and the newer versions of DirectX and Metal are only supported on newer hardware. So suppose you have you have a slightly older phone or you have a 10 year old desktop computer, it may not be able to run the newer features. So even if you're if you've picked an operating system and a a GPU API, you have to negotiate which feature level you're willing to target and which users you're willing to exclude from your application. So portability is kind of a hard question. You have to figure out how you're going to make your application use different APIs on different platforms if you do want to be cross-platform. Probably the hardest part of this is that when you write code that runs on the GPU, you use what's called a shading language. And each of those different APIs have different shading languages. So either you're going to have to rewrite your shaders for each platform, or you're going to have to figure out some cross compilation setup where your build system includes a shader compiler, which increases complexity. And even then, you still have to negotiate platform specific features when you're doing so. So it's kind of a big headache. And the approach that I've taken with Ochre is just to choose a very small subset, the smallest possible subset of GPU features that are going to be available pretty much anywhere that are still going to let us leverage GPU performance advantages and are still going to let us do the UI graphics that we would like to do. So um, to get into a little bit more detail about what a vector render actually has to do, there are kind of two aspects. So the first aspect is you take these shapes so for instance, a font glyph, a letter in a font, it's basically defines a solid region bounded by a curve. And the renderer has to determine which pixels are inside or outside that curve, and then fill them in with the appropriate color, whether that's a solid color or a gradient. And then the other aspect is taking multiple shapes like that and compositing them in order using what's called the painter's algorithm, where it's called that because later things that you draw paint over earlier things. So the second step, compositing, which is on the left here, GPUs are really good at it. And like I mentioned before, this is what operating systems and browsers have been making a lot of use of GPUs for for a long time now. So it's, it's just an easy thing to do with GPUs, and they're very good at it. It's much more power efficient than doing it with the CPU. On the other hand, the painting, the operation that I will call painting, which is determining inside and outside of a shape like this, is it doesn't come naturally to GPUs. 
since they kind of only natively speak in triangles. So you have to somehow translate these types of shapes into triangles in one way or another for the GPU to understand. So that's the hard part. There are a lot of different approaches to doing so. So I have this kind of spectrum here from renders that use more CPU to renders that use more GPU. This is a is a huge oversimplification. So this is super subjective and on in different ways, you could argue that these should be in different orders. So this is just intended to kind of give a broad overview. So on one end, we have doing rendering entirely on the CPU. And then as we move down, there's tessellation, which is an approach that basically busts apart a shape like this into triangles and then just shovels the triangles over to the GPU to be rendered. And it's robust, it's simple, it does work well for performance, but there are some big downsides, namely that GPUs aren't capable of rendering triangles with the type of anti-aliasing that you need for small text. So you kind of have to do a hybrid approach if you use tessellation um, and maybe render your text on the CPU and your bigger shapes on the GPU. And um, there's another approach called stencil and cover. And it's, it's called that because it uses a feature of the GPU called the stencil buffer to rather than doing the kind of mathematically hard operation of breaking apart a concave curved shape into triangles. It just, it draws sort of picks a point and draws a fan of triangles out from that point in such a way that they all cancel each other out to leave only the points inside the shape filled and the points outside the shape empty. And it, it has the same disadvantages as tessellation where the, it's hard to get really high quality anti-aliasing and um, while it makes more use of the GPU, it's also an inherently less efficient algorithm than CPU rasterization methods. So it's kind of a trade-off. It's not a it's not a pure win. Um, there's an example of a library that does this called NanoVG, which it uses the stencil and cover approach. It has to take a hybrid approach with text rendering, where it renders text on the CPU and big shapes on the GPU. NanoVG was a big inspiration to Ochre because it's it's the same kind of minimal library focused on portability and working on as many situations as possible. So as we move further down, we get these more complicated approaches um, such as Pathfinder, which is a Rust library written by Patrick Walton. And Pathfinder was probably the number one inspiration for Ochre. I'm not sure if I would have, have written Ochre without Pathfinder, so I have to give some big acknowledgements to Patrick Walton for that. Pathfinder is kind of a refinement of the stencil and cover approach that does a lot of CPU work to split the shapes up so that you only have to do work near the edges rather than in the big opaque centers of the shapes. Um, so it's it's really a CPU GPU hybrid. You're doing work in both places and it can it can really outperform CPU rasterizers like Cairo, but um, it's it's kind of a hybrid approach like that. It's not pure GPU. And then you you um the next item on my list here is a vector textures architecture, which is it works kind of differently. There the way it works is you have a CPU pre-process, and then you can render it many times on the GPU from different angles, for instance, in a 3D scene. So it offloads a lot of work to the GPU, but unfortunately it kind of has performance trade-offs more appropriate to a game than to a UI because um, the reason for that is the end-to-end -end render time from loading a font or or generating a scene from scratch to pr processing it, uploading it, and rendering it on the GPU is not even really faster than maybe full-on CPU rasterization sometimes. Um, so I, I don't consider this a good approach for UIs, but it is a good approach for other situations such as games. And then finally, last on the list, we have a pure GPU compute renderer, which basically uploads the scene as a data structure to the GPU, uses modern GPU compute features to render it from scratch there. Um, you'll notice Pathfinder also appears here because Patrick Walton in, in recent months developed another renderer for Pathfinder that uses GPU compute. And um, along with that, there's another Rust library called Piet GPU that um, 
was developed by Ray Flavine. And both of these get really impressive performance when you're using a, a high-end GPU. They scale up unlike any of the other approaches to really using the GPU. Um, but there's there's kind of this central trade-off here. As you use the GPU better, you can scale up better with bigger GPUs, but it makes it harder to work on older hardware and it makes it harder to port between different APIs. And this is, as I understand it, this is why Pathfinder has both renderers because the, the non-compute render is um, trying to achieve more portability. So Ochre is also an attempt to kind of strike a balance on this trade-off. And it is an attempt to strike a balance closer to tessellation in the portability sense, but kind of still achieve high enough anti-aliasing quality that you can render text with it. So um, let me go over a little bit of my earlier process that led me to the current state of Ochre. So the first thing that I worked on, um, I was working on this for about a year, um, starting about a year and a half ago. And it works like the vector textures architectures I mentioned earlier. Um, so it has the trade-offs that I mentioned where it's better suited to a 3D game where you render something that's the same many times from different angles. Um, and I, I put a lot of work into this and then I decided it wasn't the appropriate approach for UIs. So I've kind of shelved it for now, but um, gouache will return eventually. Um, but I was searching for something that that struck that trade-off better for UIs. And um, this was the first thing I got really excited about. So I call it sparse scanline rendering. And the way it works is um, it only renders the pixels that are intersected by the the outlines um and then it and then it uploads those to, as horizontal lines to the gpu so i also like to call it the gl lines go burr architecture um so you can see on this diagram anything that's not a pixel intersected by the curve doesn't have to be processed on the cpu um and it just gets filled in by the gpu which is good at good at doing kind of simple, highly parallel tasks, like filling in a bunch of solid pixels. So um, so yeah, you can see here, this is what the horizontal lines look like that get uploaded to the GPU. And you can, you can actually think of this architecture as run length encoding the image. So you, you have to upload less data and compute less data in the first place because you inherently skip all the work of the solid spans. And this was, um, this had much better performance than I expected from how kind of weird of a design and how also how simple it is. So for for complex scenes like the the there's a tiger scene that this is a this is a clipping of, I was getting times that were ten times as fast as Cairo, which is a single threaded CPU only renderer. So that was really promising, <clears throat> but it has some downsides. Basically, it doesn't handle um, humongous solid spaces very well. So if you're rendering a full screen rectangle, the GPU gets stressed out by how many lines you're trying to shovel through it. And it is about five times slower than just doing it with two rectangles. So I, I tweaked this approach and I ended up closer to, this is actually very similar to what Pathfinder does, but it, it basically does more on the CPU, whereas Pathfinder does more on the GPU. Basically, I break the shape down into um, edge edge tiles and spans. So rather than edge pixels in it and solid spans, I have eight by eight edge tiles and then solid eight by n spans in the middle. And then I pack these into an atlas texture, upload that to the GPU and render it all using, using triangles to make up those rectangles. This is an example texture atlas for this is what it looks like for the tiger this is all of those little eight by eight chunks put in order in the atlas so so that's how ochre works and um i'm going to get a little bit more into how it how it works from an api design standpoint so basically i i wanted ochre to be usable as a component rather than kind of taking over 
the design of your program if you use it. So when when it builds these tiles and spans, the what it does is it just builds that data for you. And then you can take that data and you can upload it yourself to the GPU. So that lets you, um, whether you're on DirectX or OpenGL or Metal, whether you have an existing game engine you want to use or you're using some proprietary console API that I couldn't have even foreseen um, or added to Ochre as, as an API. You can just add the support yourself very straightforwardly using some simple operations. And, um, and it will still use the GPU efficiently, but all the work, um, all the work to build this data is done for you by Ochre. And then, so I like to, I like to think of this as humble library design where you, you respect what the user wants to, to do. The user knows best their platform and performance things, performance constraints. And um, you just make a library that, that can serve as a component alongside the other components of an application, um, rather than kind of trying to take over and insist on things being done a certain way. I think that's the best way to be portable because it allows many different situations to make use of your library. Um, and I guess one more shout out for inspiration here would be the Dear MGUI library, which is a a UI rendering library for C++, which takes a very similar approach and it's been it's been used in very diverse scenarios, including the the um, code base for the Large Hadron Collider, I believe. So um, being humble like this gets you a long way. Anyway, so that's how Ochre works and that's why I made it the way I made it. Um, it's on GitHub. I'm hoping to release it on crates.io fairly soon. Anyway, thank you for listening.